Good morning. I'd like to use for a sermonic theme this morning, make room or making room. I have a friend who's a truck driver. And one of the things I like about having a friend as a truck driver is I've learned a lot about things I might not necessarily know about a truck driver uh, through this friend. For a few years, he drove solo, but then he discovered it is more lucrative to have a partner uh, when you're driving a truck. You see, when you're, you're driving alone, when you stop the rest, the truck stops the rest, amen? <laughs> but when you have a partner, you both can do 10 to 11 hour rotations, and so while you're sleeping, your partner is driving and vice versa. Uh, while you're driving, your partner is sleeping. So he got a new partner this year, and they both had trucks. And so they couldn't drive both of the trucks. They needed to be able to drive one. And so being kind of the easy go person that he is, he gave his truck up. And so he walks over on the appointed day, an hour early to her truck. And what do you think he discovers? There's no room for his stuff. He's like, there was so much stuff in that truck. If you've been in a semi, they have beds, they have refrigerators, all kind of stuff. It's like a, like a kind of like a motel in your, your truck. And so she was like, you're an hour early. But what he said to her was, even with an hour, if I come an hour late still, this is a lot of stuff. She needed to desperately get rid of some of her stuff to make room for him. Now I want you to think about that on a spiritual level. This concept of room is an important one for us to ponder because whether it is in our home or our work life or our church or spaces we occupy, we find ourselves with this notion of wondering, is there room for us? Is there really room for us? Do we fit in? Do we belong? Is this a space where I can enter and be myself? We make room when we are willing to remove some of our stuff. We make room for people when we are willing to forgive. We make room when we are willing to change how we operate so that others might feel more comfortable. This notion of room is powerful when we think about what we might be required to do to make our invitation and our hospitality even more effective. For Paul, he didn't want to tell the community what to do, and so he appealed to their hearts. This is where we enter the biblical text today. Paul has encountered Onesimus. They have time on their hand, and he gets to feel and know Onesimus. He is really impressed with his character and thinks that this person could really be good for the church. Except maybe this person has a little bit of a history. Maybe he did some things in his past, and maybe the community where he used to be remembers those things. They have not seen him in his present state. Their last memories are not so great. And so the writer is wanting to appeal not to commands, but to their heart to consider what he has to say about who Onesimus is today. Onesimus has changed. He's grown up. He is someone that could be of value to you today. And even though I really enjoy him here, I think it'd be better for me to send him back to you. I really need this community to make room for Onesimus now. He's not what he used to be, period. A minute ago, there was someone in our church who had grown up and matured here, and this member would often say to me, they still see me as their child, but they do not see me as a mature adult. I have to admit, I didn't really totally get the gripe. I'm like, well, just be an adult, you know? Jesus mentions it too, that in his ho hometown, they were kind of stuck on who he used to be, and it clouded their ability to see who he was now. Sometimes when folks burn bridges and repeat unproductive behavior, we come to see them one way. So when they speak, we kind of dismiss them. Or sometimes we've known folks a long time and we come to see them in a very limited way. And so when they speak again, we dismiss them. It's hard to see them any other way because that's who they are. Oh, that's just so-and-so. That's just, that's, that's how she operates, especially when we have had repeated access to their performances, we dismiss them. And we certainly don't make room for them. 
I'm watching virgin rivers. I can't get enough of West Coast mountains and rivers this summer. They say some of the scenery for this movie comes from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, even though it's supposed to be set in California. Well, in this movie, there's a doctor and his estranged wife. They see each other every day, but they are separated. He made one mistake 20 years ago. Yeah, the big one, infidelity. And he's been apologizing for 20 years. He apologizes over and over and over again. Everyone knows that Doc loves hope. He apologizes over and over and over again. But this was her third husband, and she really trusted him. Some think he should just stop trying. After 20 years, I'd have given up much sooner. It's clear that she's holding on to something beyond him, and her inability to forgive and let it go allows her not to make room for what their relationship could be. Sometimes hurt and pain can keep us from making room in our future for others and what could possibly be. Making room can be complicated by the person's behavior, as in the text today. We don't know it, but it's implied. In my family, there are some people that struggle with addiction. I'm sure some of y'all got it in your family, too. Don't even act it. But I have one younger cousin who is diagnosed with AIDS. You know, AIDS. That's when you move beyond HIV. And he suffers from substance abuse. I don't know which came first. He's also an out-of-the-closet gay man who is very religious and I think conflicted a little bit about his sexual identity. Because of his addiction, he has burned down bridges. He's borrowed money and not paid it back. He has stolen from us. And when you see him coming, you want to make sure that your possessions are on lockdown and in a safe space. That's the relationship he's created with his family. He has well earned the reputation in our family as someone we don't trust. I'm convinced he's burned down not only a lot of bridges, but he's burned a few brain cells up there. But something happened this year. He left his home in Atlanta, Georgia, and he went to intensive program, uh, an, an intensive drug treatment program in Iowa. On August the 19th, he graduated from that intensive program. He is now working. He is supported through a drug-free community. He moved from his environment. He moved from the place that is tempting to a place he knows nothing about. And he lives in a community of intentionality. And it's not easy. He's working hard. He is trying to do something different. Talk about making room for something different to occur. It's too early to say what he will do, and maybe the naysayers are out. But you know what? I celebrate. I give God glory for the 30 days of sobriety that he has experienced. Every time he hollers an accomplishment, I make room for who he could be. Because even though he could relapse, this could be it. He's sober, and he's experiencing life as a sober individual. It is a delicate moment, but I am hoping and praying that he really stays on that road. And I invite you to add, for those that pray, Ronnie Jr. to your prayer time. Making room is not easy. We put labels on people and often consign them to boxes. We write them off. We, we, we gossip about them. Let's keep it real. We accept this is who they are and nothing is going to change. We sometimes just say, hey, we throw our hands up in the air. It's sort of like uh, my front seat. Up until this year, often the front seat in my car was empty. For those of you that drive and your front seat is often empty, maybe you've been tempted like me. You throw stuff in that front seat, don't you? You put your lunch in there, you put your bag, because you know no one's going to sit there, right? Well, this year, someone in my household got a little bit taller, a little bit bigger, moved from the back seat to the front seat, and I'm having to change how I operate. Even coming to church today, had to open the trunk and put my stuff appropriately. I am having to change. I'm having to make decisions about where I put my stuff, and even if I need all my stuff, Making room requires us to clear some stuff off our plates, clear some stuff off our front seat, clear some stuff in our lives. For churches especially, 
we will need to make changes and changes and be very open to making space that allows other people to feel welcome. Sometimes we think only about what we want in church and we don't think about how making room for others may require us to feel just a little bit more uncomfortable. Now, I know you heard me say this a couple of times, making room is not always easy. Paul appealed to this community's heart. In Ireland this summer, I learned about St. Patrick. There are a few stories circulating around his presence, but I got to visit a museum dedicated to St. Patrick solely and to listen to supposedly factual information. And according to the autobiographical Confessio of Patrick, when he was about 16, he was captured by Irish pirates from his home in Britain and taken as a slave to Ireland, looking after animals. He lived there for six years before escaping and returning to his family. After becoming a cleric, he returned to Northern and Western Ireland of his own accord. In later life, he served as a bishop, but little is known about the places he worked in Ireland. By the seventh century, he had already come to be revered as a patron saint of Ireland. Now it's hard to go back in time and extrapolate accurate information on St. Patrick just as it is about the Bible. That's why we don't wanna beat people up and hold them hostage because it's hard to really know actually what happened. So we have to temper with these documents carefully. But here is what possibly could be said about St. Patrick, that he thought the Irish people were worthy enough to come back. He was drawn back, reminding me of this text today, of wanting to send Onesimus back. He made room in his heart for Ireland. The island and the community grew on him. You can tell people what to do, but they're often not as receptive. I found that as a leader, that when you tell people what to do, they're not feeling it, are they? You ain't going to tell me what to do. <laughs> and we have gotten more insolent about it. But maybe during Paul's time, it was different. But what's interesting here is he is intentional in not telling them what to do, in appealing to their heart and appealing to the love for this community. He is making room for their capacity to do what is best for the community. He appeals to their goodness. Sounds like a good leadership skill to have in one's toolbox. But Paul has something serious on his heart. He needs this community to take Onesimus back. That is his agenda. He sees so much potential in this person, and he knows there's been some tensions between him and the community, and they don't tell us all of that so we can use our imagination. And he knows that there's something there. He needs them to radically shift, and he appeals to their, their hearts. I appeal to your heart to be open to this person that I want to send back. Sometimes when we make room, we actually give space for others to do better. And isn't that really the business of the church? To see folks improve, to see their potential, to believe in them when it seems like it's not there to walk by faith and not by sight, to move closer to God and others, to break the chains of addiction, to break the chains of unhealthy living, to break the chains of dysfunction, to believe that God can change anybody? Isn't, isn't that our business? Not often, and sometimes in increments, but sometimes I get to see folks radically change. I have seen folks grow tired of the path that they are on. I have seen folks with support change the direction of their lives. And when it happens, it's a beautiful thing to witness. In the words of Tremaine Hawkins, a wonderful change has come over me. Often we make subtle changes, but some people make radical changes and we all notice and the more we make room for it, the more God will astound us. But it requires us to really open our hearts. It is often the thing we least expect.
because we allow the past to dictate our view of people and situations. I began today with this story about my friend who's a truck driver, and I will end with this driver, me. When I am backing up, I look at the rear view member, I, I look out of the rear view mirror, and I turn my head around and look back. I don't know how you all as drivers do it. This is how I was taught, and it's worked for over 20 years, except for I got a new car. And now the car puts a picture up of everything behind me. What do you think I do when I go to back up? I look at the rear view mirror, and I turn my head around. And then this older individual that lives in my household says, why don't you use that thing that's right in front of you? Why are you twisting your head all around? It's right there. After saying it several times, I had to ask myself, and I thought to myself, honestly, I don't use it because I don't have any use for it. I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've been backing up just fine. I feel disconnected from this thing. But after constant reminders a couple of weeks ago, I decided to give it a try. Again, my brain is wired to look back, so it was hard. But I looked at the picture, and they've got like a red line, a yellow line, and a green line. I guess the red line, the closer you get to it, you should stop. But I'm looking at it, and I'm making small changes. And I know, I know United, if I keep on this path of keeping myself open and making room, I will acquire a brand new way of backing up. I am making room for God to show up continually making room in my front seat, making room in my back seat, making room in my life, making room at how I back up. And I invite you all to, I know some of you are already far beyond me and you're already making lots of room already, but this is an invitation. God has done wonderful things for others and won't God do it for us? Won't God do it for this church? Onesimus change. I can hear Tremaine Hawkins, and I can't sing like her. What a wonderful change had come over Onesimus. And the only thing that was holding Onesimus back was the community's ability to make room. Amen. <laughs>